Welcome, everybody. I'm Doris Epstein, co-chair of the Canadian Institute for Jewish Research. After the worst massacre of Jews on a single day since the Holocaust, many in the international community, especially American President Joe Biden, have concluded that there's only one way to fix the situation, to bring peace to the Middle East, and that's with the creation of a Palestinian state. In fact, the American National Security Advisor says he wants a contiguous Palestinian state, stretching from Gaza through Judea and, and Samaria. Tonight, Professor Fred Krantz, CIJR director, reveals the reality behind this problematic solution and what's really behind President Biden's course of action. First, let's have a minute to thank our community sponsors for having sponsored this evening and promoted it for us. The Canadian Education and Antisemitism Foundation, Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights, the Lodger Congregation, End Jew Hatred Canada, Adath Israel Congregation, Israel Activist Calendar, the International Council of Jewish Women, the NGO Committee to End Antisemitism and Promote Peace at the UN, and the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem, Canada. Thank you all. First, a little history about how CJAR came to be. About 35 years ago, literally in a basement in Montreal, a group of professors headed by Professor Krantz were seeing growing anti-Semitism on Montreal campuses. They began the battle of combating it, organizing speakers, publications, conferences, anything and everything that to fight the misinformation and bias against Israel and the Jewish people. A battle that unfortunately continues to this day and with even greater urgency. Through CJAR publications such as the Daily Briefing, which Professor Kratz edits, you will find in-depth fact-based reporting on Israel, Jewish culture and world politics, information that is credible, that you can believe, and that you'll never find anywhere else. We have to remind you, though, that CJAR is a not-for-profit organization. Our work with students and for Israel is entirely dependent on your tax-free donations. And for the information for people that wanted to know, is this session being recorded? Yes, definitely it's being recorded, and you can get it at your leisure later. So get your questions ready for Professor Krantz on Q&A. And now, Professor Krantz. Thank you. Thank you, Doris. Can you see me? I'm not. Uh, I'm yes. Not on yes. You can see me. OK. I uh, appreciate your introduction. I want to thank our staff in Montreal and in Toronto, you and Alan Herman and Sally Zerker and our new um, Toronto Advisory Council, which is being put together, and all these sponsors whose good work we support in turn. We have to work together. We're facing a grave situation, which I'm going to describe now. I'm going to look at the uh, problem in terms of a number of related uh, categories. One is, uh, what is the two-state solution? What is the background? What is Israel facing? What is the relationship to uh, the region? What is the relationship to global players like Russia and China, and of course, Iran in the region? What about American politics? Why has American support for Israel under the Biden administration taken a nosedive and become extremely dangerous? All of these issues have to be looked at. And one final observation I'd like to make at the end of the talk, how does this relate to the problem of the Holocaust? We thought that problem had been almost not resolved, but put in place, put in, in, in perspective after World War II, after the Holocaust, with the miraculous rebirth of our Jewish state and sovereignty in our holy land. And now it's all come back. The, the, the problem that few people are registering is that Gaza, the crisis, the pogrom, 
the world reaction uh, re, re raises doubts again, raises anxieties, deepest anxieties about the situation and fate of the Jewish people. And that has to be addressed. It's very important and very, uh, um, moment, very seeming at the moment, very fitting. And I'll come back to that at the end. So I hope we'll have a long and decent, uh, interesting question and answer period when I complete. I'd like to begin now by saying that we are facing a moment of uh, extreme peril, great political and uh, diplomatic crisis, historical, a historical juncture for Israel and for the Jewish people. And one of the themes of my talk tonight will be, I'm, I'm talking to you from Washington, D.C., by the way, where I am at the moment. One of my themes is that a great deal is at stake for the United States in what happens in Gaza and for the world as a result. So there is a, there are a set of intersecting circles which have to be looked at and, and considered. But we'll begin with the uh, Gaza situation. Israel's struggle against uh, Hamas is an existential struggle. It is about the very survival of the Jewish state, Hamas and of Iran behind it, and of Iran's supporters behind them, is to destroy the Jewish state. The Hamas people have said clearly, they will continue at this again and again. They will never stop. We are fighting an ex existential war. So the outcome of the Gaza situation should be the destruction of Hamas and the setback, a decent and meaningful setback to the campaign to delegitimate the Jewish state. That's what we're looking at here. Uh, in the States, the leftist, woke, pro progressive Democratic Party has, in fact, um, broken with traditional American support for, for Israel, at least since 1967. And we find that by Biden and his foreign secretary, Blinken, and others in the administration, Schumer and the, at the head of the Senate, calling on uh, the world to uh, put pressure on Israel not to destroy Hamas, not to do away with the autonomy of this so-called Palestinian entity, which threatens Israel, but rather in some way to uh, turn the clock back to where it was before October 7th. And it's the burden of my talk tonight that this is a mistaken and dangerous policy and that the world will not succeed. We are not going back to October 7th. We'll have to discuss this as we go and in the question and answer period. So let me begin with what is the two-state solution? That phrase is an oxymoron. It's contradictory. There are not two states in the region, in fact. There is one state, Jewish state, Israel. The Palestinian Authority is not a state, has no status as such, nor do they wish to be a state, as we'll see in a moment. And nor is it a solution. The two-state issue is exactly the problem that we're looking at. It keeps alive the possibility for the Islamists in the Arab world of having an entity at the heart of the Jewish state, which, can, which, is, which is a dagger poised to be thrust into it and to destroy it. So the two-state solution is a very dangerous idea. It's an old Ide fix. It goes back to the 1970s and even before. Uh, it was pushed by, by, by Soviet propaganda. The Soviets and Egypt created the Palestinian Liberation Organization, put the puppet Arafat in charge of it in order to destabilize and delegitimate the Jewish state. So we, we have to ask, why has that come up now why has it come back? It was almost gone. It's come back because the Biden administration, for various reasons, has decided that it cannot allow the uh, Palestinian entity in Gaza, led by Hamas, to be destroyed. Nor can it allow Israel, in fact, to be the predominant single power in that region. The Biden administration is in thrall to a kind of diplomatic ideological ide fixe, conceptia, a conception, that somehow or other the, and it goes back to Barack Obama, that the future of the Middle East rests with uh, domination by Shiite Iran, and not by the Sunni powers, traditional Sunni powers like Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And Biden, once elected, has held on to that idea. Trump had blocked it. Trump had done away with the uh, nuclear deal with, with Iran. Trump had put Biden put Iran under pressure, under sanctions. Biden came in and on the first day in office, totally reversed that as well as many other policies. So what we're looking at now is a uh, 
a campaign being orchestrated to deny Israel the fruits of its imminent, what is an imminent victory over the uh, Islamist murderers in Gaza and behind them their Iranian supporter. So we have to then turn from this policy shift from a, a bankrupt two-state solution, uh, which didn't work in the past and is not going to work now, and we'll come back to that, to look at regional global dynamics. What is the actual situation? At this moment, over six months into Israel's longest campaign, military campaign, uh, the war is almost won. Hamas is on its heels. They are limited to the Rafah area, really. They have lost 10 to 12,000 of their so-called fighters or terrorists. Um, Israel is on the verge of, of victory. Israel has made it very clear. Israel is unified. Remarkable unification following earlier divisions. October 7th led to that. And the Israelis will uh, not accept the reimposition of uh, an independent entity in Gaza. They will not accept that that entity be uh, run by the corrupt Palestinian authority. The Palestinian authority is uh, corrupt. Its leader Abbas is in the 18th or 19th year of his four-year term. It's a dictatorship. It's corrupt. It has very little popular support. Uh, nor will Israel return to a situation in which Hamas or any entity like it has a kind of autonomy in the region. That turned into a terribly mistaken policy uh, and led to October 7th. October 7th is the result of a massive deception on the part of Hamas and the Arab countries, leading Israel into a false sense of security. That somehow or other, although they were ideologically opposed to Israel, Hamas could be dealt with. That de facto, they, were, they wanted to rule the area and that they wouldn't make problems. And then any problems like the periodic raining of rockets on Israeli civilian centers from Gaza was really the work of a, re a renegade Islamic jihad extreme radical. It wasn't the work of Hamas. Now, we all know that that was uh, propaganda. We were taken in. Uh, Hamas was behind the entire thing. And Hamas remains the, the key opponent of Israel in Gaza. The um, Obama and Biden administration and then Biden himself uh, are supporting the Palestinian Authority. They're really supporting Hamas. Tony Blinken, the uh, rather uh, appeasement-like uh, foreign secretary of the United States traveling around the area, now equates Hamas with Israel. Israel, the Jewish democratic state fighting for its life, for its independence, is now equivalent to the murderers of October 7th in the eyes of the American uh, government's prime spokesman. The moral depravity of this position uh, goes without saying. Biden, in his State of the Union address, supposedly in an off-mic comment, which, which uh, we assume was not really off-mic, was intended, said that he was about to bring uh, Bibi Netanyahu, Israel's prime minister, to a come to Jesus moment. I mean, the uh, uh, inappropriateness of that reference to the Jewish prime minister of the Jewish state uh, is obvious. But I'll tell you, the, the, the fact of the matter is, we are now in that moment. He was not blowing off steam. He meant it. We are in this moment. Biden is putting pressure on Israel. Uh, to uh, negotiate, putting pressure on Israel uh, to uh, allow more and more food and sustenance to the supposedly starving Palestinians. They're dropping uh, food from planes by parachute, as if this were the Berlin blockade and the Palestinians were the innocent civilians of that city, which at that point was at peace. He's building a port, uh, an artificial port, again, not unlike World War II when we built mulberries to, in, in, to enable the, the landings in Normandy, building a port to bring more and more food and sustenance into the Palestinians. But a number of articles have indicated that port is there not simply to bring in food, that will play a key role in the rebuilding, the reconstruction of Gaza once they have reestablished the Palestinian Authority as the ruling power there. Uh, 
we're looking at a, a terrible reversal of American policy. Biden initially said he was a Zionist, remember, on October 8th, and he went to Israel and he pledged his undying support for the Jewish people's independence. Uh, that has changed. And we have to ask the question, why has that changed? Given Biden, Biden's political performance generally uh, since 2021, uh, the disasters on every front from the southern border to uh, the economy, inflation, uh, to schools, to the, the crime in cities, to Afghanistan turning around and fleeing Afghanistan, leaving not only the Afghans, but American citizens isolated uh, in that panic. All of this uh, is makes what he's doing in relation to Israel understandable, if not uh, acceptable. He is a political chameleon, and he will do what his, his and his party's needs demand. And so he was looking at the polls during the recent primaries, Democratic Party presidential primaries, particularly in Michigan, where there's a large Muslim American population. They voted, uh, they, they abstained in large numbers, threatening uh, a Biden for the support he's given to Israel. And he has responded and his minions in Congress have responded in kind, and they have pulled away from the support for the Jewish state, largely in order to try and, and, and secure his reelection in November. Now keep an eye on that. The November election is, is coming on us quite, quite quickly. It's about seven months away. It's a decisive election. The whole thrust of the Democratic Party under Obama and then Biden has been to so manipulate American politics as to make it the permanent dominant political party. It's a kind of very authoritarian party, extremely left-wing, particularly under the influence of the progressives, progressive wing, and of the uh, the squad, which is uh, the squad are pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas, uh, as you know, uh, crowds in the streets in Dearborn, Michigan the other day uh, were demonstrating against Biden, against Israel, and crying death to, to Israel, death to America, in the streets of Dearborn, Michigan, death to America. Now, the, this government has responded to that pressure, and that is the key problem that Israel faces. If Donald Trump were in power, you don't have to love Trump. I don't love him. He, he, he's not a perfect candidate or a perfect person. But his policies, practical policies, were superb. They were much, they, they, they were excellent. He was a great president in that respect. And he will be a great president if reelected in November. Uh, and were he the president, all of this would not be happening. And there would be no revival of the two-state solution, nor would the problem of Gaza and Iran be a problem. Keep that in mind. So we're looking at, at Israel valiantly has to defend itself its young soldiers in the IDF, male and female, heroically sacrifice themselves to protect that state. They are those who have fallen are our kadoshim, our saints. In America, the problem is political. In America, the problem is that the, the government under the Democratic Party has withdrawn from its traditional policy and turned on the Jewish state. And I'll come back to it again and again. I'm sorry to, to be repetitive. But what is at stake here is not only Israel's future, but America's and Canada's, by the way. Canada is part and parcel of this. And if anything, Trudeau and Singh and their policies are even worse than, than uh, Biden. Don't forget it. So what is at stake is American politics, the American future. America's repository as a resource, a re democratic republic based on Western values which values a great, great deal to Judaism. No accident that the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, cite the Tanakh again and again and again. There's a connection, a very real one, in terms of values. So what we're looking at is a grave crisis, because America, even as it turns against Israel, and in a way turns in on itself in a kind of neo-isolationism, which is unfolding, uh, America is uh, fighting a, a war against a new axis. I call it the new axis. Russia, China, and Iran. It is, you, you, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I, I guess we might as well touch on it now. You know, in many ways, speaking analogically, speaking in terms of an analog, analogy, we are on the eve of World War III. 
if you look around. There is a new axis composed of Russia, the Chinese, and the North Koreans. They have their henchmen, their supporters, like Turkey and North Korea, and to some extent, nuclear-armed Pakistan. And they're out to, in fact, destabilize the American global leadership in the world. That's what's at stake here. Iran is allowed to push Hezbollah, push Hamas in Gaza because that fits the Russian and the Chinese policy to destabilize America. The Houthi rebels, an almost Stone Age people, are supplied with advanced missiles in order to destabilize America and its allies in the Red Sea and to threaten the shipping in the Suez Canal. By the way, they're quite successful. The traffic in the Suez Canal has gone down by 45% Red Sea traffic. And supply chains around the world are affected. And that's part of the rising, slowly rising inflation once again that we're looking at. So we are engaged in a, a kind of incipient World War III scenario. And you can play games with this. And they're more than games. You can argue that in, one, in some sense, Russia is what Germany was in 1938-39. And China is Japan. And the U.S. is the U.S. because in 1939-1940, the U.S. was isolationist and pro-appeasement, despite FDR. And there were anti-Semitic riots on campus and streets in 1939-1940, led not by Muslims, Islamists, but by the German-American Bund, which was a pro-Nazi movement. Today, it's the progressives. It's idiotic, thuggish, virtue-signaling students shouting phrases they don't understand from the river to the sea. But they don't understand that that means genocide. So the U.S. is the U.S. once again. Uh, Ukraine is, is Czechoslovakia. Ukraine is under Russian assault. And if they fall, it will be as momentous as the fall of Czechoslovakia was in 1938. And what is Israel? Israel is, in, in a sense, if you push this analogy, Israel is Poland. Israel is where World War III can break out, which is what we're looking at. And it broke out in 1939, and appeasement failed. But Europe had a great statesman, Churchill. It doesn't have one now. And America had a leader who was ready to lead in his way, FDR, and Biden despite all the propaganda, he ain't no FDR, believe me. So let me come back to, to, to my thematic here. Israel is unified, the United States is not. Israel is threatened, but Israel has many strengths and many assets. I would like to use a metaphor here that I hope will stay with you. It's the old story of uh, the tar baby, the American Southern folktale about Br'er Rabbit and the tar baby. The tar baby is a, a doll with tar and it sticks to you and you throw it at somebody and you can't get rid of it. You try very hard, but you can. It's a tar baby. It's on your, it's, it's, it's on your back. You can't get it off your back. And Biden and the Democrats have turned Israel into a kind of tar baby. They would like to get rid of it. They would like to signal to their left-wing supporters and the Muslim vote that uh, they are not going to allow uh, Bibi Netanyahu, who they dislike and have since the Barack administration and the right-wing, center-right coalition, uh, to, to be victorious. They're going to reimpose that palestinian Dash Hamas state. But Israel is a tar baby. It doesn't get, get easily pushed aside, okay, despite your come-to-Jesus moments. Israel has the IDF. Israel has nuclear weapons. Israel has a unified population now under the leadership of a very experienced, particularly diplomatically leader, Bibi Netanyahu. And Israel has and should have, or should have, the Jewish people behind it, as it has had at earlier moments in its crisis-ridden history. And then we'll come back to the, the, the problem of American-Canadian Jewish support for Israel uh, uh, towards the end of this uh, talk. But looking at Israel's assets, what are the problems? The problem will be whether, in fact, uh, 
Iran can be kept out of this war. Israel is facing uh, another enemy, domestically, so to speak, directly proximate to it, in Hezbollah in the north, in Lebanon. Hezbollah is a, uh, an Iranian uh, creation, an Iranian puppet, just as, by the way, Hamas was a, uh, the puppet of the Soviet, uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood, the Islamist, uh, radical Islamist group in Egypt. They set up the, uh, the PLO, uh, uh, the, I'm sorry, they set up the Palestinian, yes, they set up the Palestinian Liberation Organization uh, as a, an agency for uh, destabilizing Israel. It turned into the Palestinian Authority and was given a geographical expression by the, by the terrible failure, failed Camp David Accords from 1993 forward. So Israel is facing a possible two-front war with uh, Hamas in the south and the much better armed, much better supplied uh, Hezbollah terrorists, Shiite terrorists, uh, in the north on the Lebanese border. They are there thanks to uh, the, uh, the Iranians. The Iranians have proxies all over the area. They have proxies in Syria and in Iraq. These are Islamist militias that they fund and which have been attacking American uh, forces, residual forces there. They have a proxy in, uh, in, in Yemen. The Houthi rebels now attacking shipping in the Red Sea uh, are financed and supplied by, by Iran. So again and again and again, we find the Iranians are the masterminds behind this, but they've managed to manage, they've done something very clever. They have isolated themselves from direct involvement. And Biden does not confront them because Biden looks at the Iranians in terms of that diplomatic revolution begun by Obama, which he continued, which was expressed in the nuclear accords, that somehow or other the Middle East will uh, come under Iranian domination. And that is a false and terribly dangerous obsession, which occurs again and again, and which we're confronting here once again. So the Iranians are a problem. Will they stay out of this uh, confrontation? Uh, will they uh, permit Hezbollah to rain its advanced missiles down on Israel, particularly northern Israel and Tel Aviv and the Jerusalem area? Or will they hold back? That's a, that's a variable right, right there. Another variable is the extent to which China and Russia are involved uh, in, this, in this. If they put pressure on Iran, the Iranians might in turn put pressure on Hezbollah and their other proxies. So you've got to keep an eye on the Russians and the Iranians. The Russians are involved in Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is very important. There are some, in some ways, there are very real structural similarities between Russia and uh, Ukraine and the uh, U.S. and uh, Israel and Gaza. In fact, uh, the Biden is was supporting Ukraine, but just as with Israel, he's ambivalent and wobbly, and he isn't giving the Ukrainians what they need in order to not only defend themselves, let alone defend themselves, but uh, to defeat the Russians. Uh, and that's a problem. If Russia wins in Ukraine, that will cement the Chinese relationship with Russia. The Chinese, of course, have their own agenda, and they are looking at uh, Taiwan. They're looking at the South China Sea. They are upping the ante with the Philippines and the East Asian Sea. Uh, and this is all part of this global axis that we've been talking about. Uh, Israel, if Israel loses in Gaza, Russia and China in their respective spheres will be reinforced and will become even more aggressive because it will be a proof of the weakness uh, and ineffectiveness of the United States under Biden. If Israel wins, they will have to rethink their policy. The alliance, there may be a, 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 a domino effect. The Russians will realize they can't prevail in Ukraine and step back. The Chinese will recognize that the Russians are not reliable allies. There has always been a tension and a gap between Russia and China. It involves Manchuria and who will be politically predominant in that major area of Asia. 
They are not natural allies. In fact, they are unnatural allies. And a Russian defeat could lead to a, a Chinese withdrawal and a tampering down of the pressure on Taiwan and, and elsewhere. So you have this, this domino uh, effect uh, here. And uh, a great deal turns on what is going to happen in Israel. And what we mean by victory, what we mean by defeat. What would be an Israeli defeat in Gaza at this point? It would be a buckling under somehow to, to American and international community, another, by the way, that's another oxymoron. It's neither international nor a community. Um, buckling to them and uh, allowing Hamas to survive, rebuilding their Gaza entity under uh, corrupt Palestinian authority, Aegis, and going on to threaten once again on a daily basis, the very life of the Jewish state. What is victory? And we have to keep our eyes on this. What does victory mean? And you fight wars in order to, to be victor, to be victorious. The United States didn't enter World War II in order to arrive at a, a neutral result. FDR and Churchill demanded unconditional surrender. They didn't drop food packages on Berlin or on Rome. They didn't build ports to build up uh, Germany in the course of their war against Germany. And when they killed civilians, for Americans and for the Allies, that's friendly fire. That's the, that's the fog of war. But when Israel, which takes every method to reduce civilian casualties, including telegraphing where their troops are going to be, so people, civilians can get out of the way. But when Israel has a, an accident and civilians are killed, that's uh, genocide. That's genocide. So what's good for the goose is not good for the, the gander, unfortunately. Big battalions always beat the little ones in world history, but not in Jewish history. We haven't been around for almost 6,000 years because when defeated, we disappeared, like most other people. We are still here. The uh, tar baby is still here. So we have to avoid defeat. Israel has to crush Hamas, its leadership as well as its terrorist fighters. The Palestinian Authority has to be disbanded or at least delimited to the territories at this point, at this moment. No Palestinian governing authority can be returned to Gaza, which is autonomous, which has political independence. Israel, for the foreseeable future, which may mean decades, will be in charge of security and of the military in that area. Hezbollah in the north will either recede to a safe distance uh, under uh, forceful international American Trump and Israel uh, administration, or Israel will, having defeated Hamas, have to turn and crush Hezbollah. And there are indications that that may well be in the offing, and we had better be ready for that. Over 60,000 Israelis have been displaced by Hezbollah terrorist shelling and missiles in northern Israel. They have to return home. And that home in the north, as well as in the south, has got to be safe and secure and as for as long as possible. In this world, nothing is forever. It will take 10 or 20 years, three, four decades, in which we can, in fact, try and, and develop an alternate reality in the region. So we, we, we have to be aware of what we're looking at, uh, conscious of the different forces at play, and we have to then think about how we play our role in assuring the successful outcome which is the victory of Israel, the crushing of Hamas, uh, the return to uh, relative stability, and to those conditions under which Israel, despite problems from 1948 forward, has flowered miraculously and become one of the leading technological, cultural, uh, economic powers of the world. Look at this, our little Jewish state has the most powerful military in the Middle East, the IDF. We should remember that. 
Uh, we have the most advanced technology, electronics in the world. We are a great success. And we have to ensure that that success continues, goes on, and is unbroken. I'd like to conclude. I know there, there it raises many questions. And um, one of them, major question, which I'll address in the question and answer, is really what is to be done? I think in general, what is to be done is straightforward. You support Israel, you support a unified Israel. You support, uh, in the case of the United States, the uh, Republican Party at this point, because it and its leader, Tr Trump, really are uh, behind Israel, really continue the general policy of American support, principled support for the Jewish state. And in Canada, you support the conservatives. You support Prolievre, who seems to be a good man. Uh, and there you fight the same fight that, that is being fought in the US. Uh, and you persevere. And you support all the good Jewish organizations which are joined together in this fight, like the people supporting our talk tonight. And you support your candidates, your political candidates, who are pro-Israel. And you attack the uh, Democratic Party, and you turn to the Jews, American Jews, who support, who have supported the Democrats, and and persuade them, deal with them. Let me say a, a, a word about that for a moment. Uh, American Jewry, in the last numbers of decades, have generally voted Democratic. From FDR forward, American liberal Jewry was pro-democratic. Their votes sometimes went up to 75% for the Democrats. Uh, that vote is should be at stake today. Biden is probably making a, a very big mistake in his policy shift towards the PA, towards international uh, sentiment, anti-Israel sentiment, towards the, the progressive and the left-wingers domestically. It's a big mistake. If only 30 or 40 percent of that Jewish vote changes, moves to the Republican side of the, the ledger, the way Hispanics are doing increasingly, Black people are doing, even young people are falling out of love with the Democrats. Uh, suburban women who normally vote liberal are moving away. We Jews should play our part and wake up and grasp what our interests are and what is at stake here. And one of the things all of you listening to this newscast, telecast, tonight can do is work with your neighbors, your friends, your family, your business associates. Show them what's going on. Pull the wool away from their eyes. Shame them and shame the Jewish Democratic members of Congress senators and congressmen who have not yet broken with this pro Hamas policy of their party. It is time for a great movement to emerge and to be led uh, by us, by conscious Jews who affirm the values of our countries at the same time. Canada and, and the US as outposts of Western values and of Jewish, which are which mean Jewish values at base. So be aware of this. Uh, we have a great role to play in the next seven months, and those months are crucial. We may yet turn around, Mr. Biden. He is a supremely political animal. In, in one sense, it's kind of tragic. He's come to power as the creature of the extreme left of his party. When he went to Israel and said, I'm a Zionist, he probably meant it in the sense of the traditional pro-Zionist position of his party. Uh, now he's turned against that because of political interests. And he may not be all entirely with it any longer as well. But sufficient pressure on him and sufficient polls on him may cause him to turn around before this is over. And it may cause the Democratic Party, if they have any sense, perhaps to come up with a more appropriate uh, and more possibly electable candidate. So there's a lot going on here. There are a lot of variables. And um, we should not discount the strength of Israel and the strength of our support and of the Jewish world support for Israel 
And by the way, the strength of well-meaning non-Jews, secular and religious Gentiles, one of the strongest supports for Israel comes from the uh, uh, so-called fundamentalist Christian movement in the United States and Canada. There are good people out there. Poll after poll, by the way, which is not brought to you by the media. We cannot trust the media, the, the, the regime media. It's called NBC, CBS, NBC, WNBC, CNN. We can't trust them. They're in the pocket of the Democrats. But poll after poll shows us that seven, 65 to 80 percent of the American public supports Israel's war against Hamas. Just remember that. Think about it. And that electorate, they're in the electorate. And they are uh, reachable. And they will act. And before this is over, uh, we will see a transformation, one hopes and one prays, of the current situation that we're looking at. Now, a last word, and then I'll let you have at me. A last word. The meaning of what we're looking at after the Holocaust. Find it in the notes. Yes. After the Holocaust um, and the German Nazis attempt, aided by their European henchmen, to destroy the Jewish people once and for all, we witnessed the miraculous rebirth of the state of Israel. That rebirth was an historical event, but it was also a profoundly um, important religious theological, philosophical event. It was a return of the Jewish people to history in our sovereign land, through our sovereign state. Uh, that is what is at stake at the moment. The Hamas attack provoked by Iran with Russia and China behind it, and the Americans now, unfortunately, uh, wobbling, threatens the very existence of the state of Israel, I don't think we have understood yet. A historical understanding comes late in the day. The German, the great German philosopher Hegel said, the owl of Minerva flies at midnight. Minerva is the goddess of wisdom. Wisdom comes at the end of the day. Understanding, real full understanding comes at the end of a development. But at the end of the day, we, we haven't, we, we, we must come to terms with the fact that Hamas, Gaza, the American and the world reaction, the anti-Semitism growing on our streets and campuses has created great and deep anxiety. We, have, we are witnessing the possibility of return, return of the repressed, you might say, in Freudian terms. Is it possible that this novum, this great new fact of Israel, her survival, her revival, after 2,000 years, is at stake. Can it be that Israel might yet be lost? And by the way, if Israel is lost, we are lost. Jews and Judaism will never survive the third diaspora, the third destruction of the state. And therefore, we have to struggle against it. We have to understand what is at stake. We have to condemn the Biden administration's turn to anti-Israel policy, to moral equivalence. We have to regret deeply the role of so-called Jews in all of this. Schumer, Blinken, Yellen, Mayorkas, goes on and on. It's un unfortunate and tragic. Oh. And we have to oppose them. We are gathered together this evening uh, to understand what's going on, and I hope to be strengthened in our resolve to uh, fight 
this situation. It is by no means lost, far from it. I think Israel is in a very strong position uh, in the longer term. Uh, and therefore, we have to redouble our efforts to ensure that Israel survives, wins this war, and gets through the next seven months without major hindrance, and that Mr. Trump is elected and American policy returns to sanity. Uh, one of the great students of American politics recently, former leader of the uh, House of, of the Congress, said that when you look at what's going on with Biden policy, how do you understand it? Is it, is it rational? And he said, no, it's not rational. There, uh, it's a kind of seizure of, of, of insanity. It's an insane policy. It's irrational. It is contradictory, and it can lead to great tragedy, historical tragedy, not only for Israel, but for the United States and the world. So we have every reason uh, to support Israel and every reason to play to its strengths and to our own strengths and to be confident. And I'd like that's the, the point, the, what I would like to, to, to end on tonight, that to understand something, to analyze it, is not to be overwhelmed by it. It is to begin to be able to fight it intelligently and effectively. And that is what we have to do. That is our moral responsibility, the political responsibility, and our moral responsibility. Um, we have to be conscious of who we are. We are an eternal people. We will soon celebrate our 5,785th New Year. And we are conscious of our responsibility and of what is, it, of what is at stake today in Gaza. We must be focused on securing Israel's righteous victory over evil because we face evil. Hamas, Iran, their enablers are only the most recent, the most contemporary expression of our old foe, a Malach. And Amalek never triumphs, and Amalek never will. We will defeat the new red-green Iranian Hydra. We will defeat revived anti-Semitism wherever it raises its serpentine political and cultural heads. Be confident. We will do it. As we go forward, therefore, let us never forget. Am Yisroel Chai. Am Yisroel Chai. Netzach Yisroel Lo Yishakeh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And now, after that inspiring last message, we have to go back to some very bleak questions which are being raised. Let's go to Canada first. Recently, the NDP brought a motion to officially recognize the state of Palestine and calling for a ban on military exports to Israel. Later, it was changed to a negotiated two-state solution. But the prime minister and his caucus overwhelmingly supported that motion. What do you say about it? What's your comment on that? There is an election coming in 2025, maybe even earlier, if they can get a vote of no confidence passed. All effort has to be made to defeat it. That policy of the NDP backed by Trudeau is evil. It doesn't pay to even talk about it in political terms. What it does is to enable the killers and the murderers. That cannot be the policy of a civilized nation state like Canada with the great history that Canada has. Uh, and therefore, I urge all Canadian Jews, all Canadians of decent human concern, get out there, do everything you can, delegitimate that government, use that word. They're not legitimate government any longer. Delegitimate them and defeat them and install a good man who will do the right thing, both for Canadians and for Canadian Jews and for Israel. There are many, including Newt Gingrich, the American politician, that say the Palestinians are an invented people. 
And since they are an invented people, why are they even entitled to a state? How did that happen? Yes, yeah, so the, the men I, me I mentioned at the end of my talk, the experienced American uh, politician who called Biden's policy literally insane was Newt Gingrich. Okay? Oh. Newt Gingrich. And he's quite right. The Palestinians are, to a large extent, an invented category. I said that. The notion of a two-state solution turns on the existence of a Palestinian people, which is not true. Palestine, as you see from the maps that we were using, Palestine, Palestine, the name comes from uh, the first century uh, of the Common Era, when the Romans uh, destroyed Israel, destroyed the temple, and uh, renamed the area from Judea. They called it Palestina in Latin, which meant Philistinia, the land of the Philistines. That's all it means, right? It's a geographical expression, uh, which de de never denoted a people. Uh, by the way, down into the early uh, 20th century, the uh, people who called themselves Palestinians in, in uh, historic Israel were the Jews. The Arabs would never call themselves Palestinians. That was a, a, a non-Islamist term. Uh, the, the Jews created the Palestine Post, remember, which was the Jewish newspaper of the Yeshuv, of the Jewish settlement, which turned into the Jerusalem Post. So uh, Gingrich is quite right. Now, the, on the other hand, there, there, there was an Arab people, an Arab an ethnically Arab people, Muslim Arab people living in the region, living also in what is today Syria, and today is Iraq, today is Jordan, um, and today is Gaza, and so on. That that people uh, uh, converted in the course of the Arabic the Islamic expansion in the 7th and 8th centuries, and they were there. But they had no national expression, nor did they want one. One of the reasons why the two-state solution is not a solution is that it's not wanted by the Arabs, neither by the Islamists, Hamas, uh, Hezbollah, or by the so-called secular uh, Islamists, the PLO. Well, they how did the idea even take root? Well, let me, I'll, I'll tell you if you give me a moment. The, uh, uh, they don't want a state. They don't know what a state is. States were imposed on them by the Europeans. After World War I, Europe, the French and the British created Syria. They created Iraq. They created Jordan, which was originally called Transjordan, right? These were colonialist entities where uh, the, the colonial powers were the manipulators. Uh, Britain inherited uh, Judea, historic Judea, uh, when it defeated the Turkish Empire in 1917. The Ottomans had ruled the area. The Ottomans had never given states to the subject Arabs. The Arabs ruled by regional uh, provincial administrators in what were called milliets, milliets, provincial areas where Power lay in the hands of the Turkish overseer and the local uh, heads of families, right? The local clan heads. That was the political organization. Iran has revived the notion because Iranian, the Re Iranian revolution uh, with Khomeini was an Islamic theological revolution. They revised the idea, idea of the caliphate. They want to bring back the rule of an Islamic ruler, an Islamic, an Islamic Caesar, an Islamic head of state who unifies his religion and state as under the Turkish uh, rule, uh, uh, under the Turkish heads. So when the Hamas people, they don't want a state. They don't want two states. That's, that's the, the great contradiction here and why the Biden policy is so, so destructive, because they don't want the state. If you have two states, it means it's going to be a Jewish state. And the one thing they want and are ready to die for is to destroy that Jewish state. There shall be no Jewish sovereignty on Islamic land. All shall be subject to Allah, to Islam. They don't want two states. Where did the idea come from? It came from the yeah. British, the French, and the colonials. And it was picked up after World War II, with the, well, picked up in the League of Nations to some extent, but not even there, because the League of Nations confirmed uh, the, the right of the Jews to a homeland in Palestine that the Balfour Declaration had given us in 1917. Wasn't, wasn't that the original two-state solution? That no, Palestine no, was for a Jewish homeland? No, no, Iraq, no, no. Lebanon, and Syria were for the Arabs. That's not two states. The, you have other states in the region. You had, for instance, you always, the Egypt was a state. Egypt is, Egypt is the one area which had a kind of uh, monarchical tradition dating back to antiquity. 
and was given parliamentary form in the 19th century. But the French and the British created states. You had a Syrian state, you had a, an Iraqi state, but you didn't have a Palestinian Arab state in the British mandate. You had a Jewish state. That's the point. So what happens is with World War II and with the, the whole Nazi movement and the uh, British closing down of immigration to Palestine unconscionably in 1939, the White Paper, uh, dooming European Jewry really and, uh, to extinction. But you had there then this, this emergence of uh, a false kind of, quote, Palestinian, unquote, uh, nationalism. Uh, the the uh, Mufti, Al Husseini, in uh, Palestine goes over to Hitler and they plan to uh, destroy the Jews and to raise up the Arabs and to create at that point, to create a new Arab state in the place of the Jewish Yishuv. So that, 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 but there's never been a two-state solution in that respect. However, the Soviets in uh, the 1970s, in order to contest control of the Middle East with the United States, they cultivate an Islamist revanchist movement, terrorist, led by none other than Yasser Arafat. It's the Soviets who create, with the help of Egypt, which was very radical at that point, they create the Palestine Liber Liberation Organization, and they bring an Egyptian named Yasser Arafat in to head it. He poses as a Palestinian, but he really wasn't. His family was from Egypt. And that's the origin of this. So the Soviets created the Palestine Liberation Organization. And then the, the Iranians, when they came to power, wanting a, an Islamist and religious radical movement, created Hamas in opposition to PLO. That's the key thing. They created Hamas to oppose the PLO and to contest PLO domination in the region. So that's where you get this uh, contestation between Israel, which is a true state approved by the UN, and this fiction of a Palestinian entity pushed by first the Soviets and then by the Iranians. Uh, by the way, latest news, the Hamas and the PLO are having at each other. They are imprisoning their respective representatives. There is violence. Neither of they can cooperate. The whole notion that the PLO is going to, that the Palestinian Authority created out of whole cloth by the Camp David Accords is going to preside over a recreation of Palestine alongside Israel is an absurd. Uh, that was a question. Yeah. What about governance of Gaza after? Yeah, that, that, that comes, that, that, that's a very concrete question. A number of your viewers have asked me that. I saw their questions before the talk. Uh, what, will God, what will the situation look like after the Iran Israeli victory? And there, I think you just have to see what Netanyahu and his coalition are saying. There will be no Hamas, there will be no PLO, no Palestinian authority. I call it the PLO because Fatah is the basis of the Palestinian authority. Fatah is the political movement of the PLO. Uh, there will be no political Palestinian authority. There will be no autonomy, political autonomy. There will be no Palestinian state or state in, 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 in becoming in the area. There will be a process of weeding out any pro-Hamas, any radical Palestinians, in terms of those who are, in fact, allowed to return to, to Gaza. Uh, there will be uh, uh, local rule by, uh, in my eye, I've written an article on this recently uh, in Jewish News Service on uh, Biden's come to Jesus moment, uh, where I said the, the, the solution probably will be some kind of depoliticized Palestinian uh, region uh, in which local power is given to the heads of families and clans and Israel, and with perhaps a figurehead uh, chief administrator or president called from pro-Israel Palestinians, and there are some, a few, and with authority in the hands of political authority, military authority in the hands of Israel. There is no going back to a situation in which in the south of Israel and the north of Israel, Jews are submitted to almost daily terrorist incursions and missile bombings and uh, fragility of life. That cannot be allowed. Israel must assure and a decent American administration will back Israel. Remember, it's Trump 
who defunded the Pal UNRWA. It's Trump who took the funding away from the PLO, from the Palestinian Authority. Let's get him back in power and let's put the situation in, in, in by the way, talking about Trump, it's a, a, a question from another viewer. A question from another viewer. Let how me, go ahead, how go can we excuse the fact that Trump is for the white Christian nationalists? Because he is. Because he isn't. The how can of, that? And just read your newspaper. Read the read the read, read the Wall Street Journal. Read the Washington uh, Times. Read the National Post in uh, in in Canada. Uh, these are lies. This is propaganda put out by the Democrats. Trump has never embraced white nationalists. He's not a racist. His children are married to Jews. He's got Jewish grandchildren. He's the guy who restored uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Uh, black people are voting for him in greater and ever greater numbers. Uh, he did more for minorities in the States than any president prior to him. This is nonsense. It's propaganda. People have to wake up and be critical, use their senses, use your Jewish sechel, use your Yiddish cup, and think for yourselves. That's what I, that's my advice there. Well, back to the United States. Can Israel exist without the United States? That is a, a, a very good question. Uh, it's one of these questions that has no answer. I don't think it's a, it's a hypothetical. And hypotheticals can be answered in many ways. Better to say, look, let's let's move towards a situation in which the United States, which is the greatest world power, and a power based on the Constitution, on, on Western values, a, a great successful society in which Jews have thrived, as well as other minorities, in which people are in minorities, by the way. In a democratic republic, you're an individual. You have rights. And those rights are yours. They're not the rights of the state. The state, the government, the Democrats don't give you anything. They're ours. The government has got to be there to serve us, right? And to leave us alone to the extent possible. That's called liberty. It's called freedom. So let's think not in terms of worst case scenarios where the United States may be overthrown by uh, internal revolution on the part of uh, terrorists or external uh, threats by, by the Russia and China. Let's think in terms of holding these powers off, defeating them, bringing the U.S. back on screen, working together with Israel, and working together to create a stable, decent world order. We've had lots of problems since 1945. Lots of terrible things have happened, but on balance, the world has survived, and we will survive. We had, just have to get things right. Israel, again, I want to underline this. Israel is strong. Israel has to remain united. You can't go back to the divisions prior to October uh, 7th. You have to support the government. Yes, there will be a reckoning, by the way. When the war is over, those responsible for the terrible failure of intelligence on October 7th have to be brought to justice. There was a terrible collapse. And responsibility has to be dealt out, and it may have to go to the to the to, to Netanyahu and those around him. But for the moment, he has to be supported, and his defense cabinet, unity cabinet, has to be supported. And he is, in terms of dealing with the U.S., remarkably in, endowed with experience, diplomatic experience. He's been at it for a long time and quite successfully. Uh, and so, for the moment. We have to move forward as one people, Am Yisrael, one people united, and united with world Jewry, and above all, with the great Jewries of the United States and Canada, which now are called on to do their part. I have to read this question because I like how it's worded. Please comment on Obama holdovers in current administration and Obama directing policy from his basement wearing sweatpants. <laughs> which basement? True, not true. What do you say? Which basement is he using? He's got three, you know. He's got <laughs> three, three multi-million dollar houses in California and Washington and Chicago. Uh, the man of the people. Look, the 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 the. Uh, from my perspective, the Obama administration is a disaster. It really is. Uh, they 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 call it. Oh, 
O'Biden, it's the O'Biden administration, or sometimes it's called Obama Biden three. It's so uh, it's clearly the the Obama people are pulling the strings. Biden, to some extent, is a puppet. The people like um, um, Susan Rice and uh, Klain, who recently withdrew, David Axelrod, others, Biden himself, Schumer, uh, they they are pulling the strings. And the only way to deal with them is to defeat them politically. They are immensely clever and uh, evil, I would say. That's too too strong a word, perhaps, for some, but manipulative, if you will. They control the major media, which is a great disaster that we are not informed. Part of the problem is the United States electorate. Half of it watches the regular media, the regime media, and they simply are not informed. Do an experiment one night. Follow the news on, on Fox, right? And then turn on the news on NBC or NBC or CBS or CNN, watch it. And you will discover that major issues are simply not addressed. Until recently, the public did not know that the southern border was a problem unless you watched Fox or listened to uh, uh, Mark Levin or Hugh Hewitt, Hugh Hewitt on radio. By the way, listen to Mark Levin. Get on your radio. Check your, your computer, you'll find them. Look at you, you it. Listen to Chris Plant in Washington, D.C., superb uh, commentator, ironic, funny, comic, but dead serious. There are good, good sources of information out there. Use them. But yes, they are a corrupt. It's a corrupt administration. It, it acts in terms of its own interest, in terms of power. It wants only control. It thinks it's on the edge of becoming the dominant American power. Forever, they want to. They're authoritarian. They're not committed to a, a, a multi-party system at all. They have to be defeated. The Democratic Party will have to be reformed as a result of its loss in the November 2024 election. That's an, a major issue, which we'll probably see a lot of writing about in the near future. So these issues are all at play, uh, but les jeux ne sont pas faits. The game is not yet up by any means, and. From my reading, uh, the movement of history, to use that awful phrase, is certainly in our, decor in our, in our direction. It's at least arguable. Talk about reform. Yeah. It's in our uh, direction. Talk about reform. Biden and other leaders are talking about reforming the Palestinian Authority. Yes, well, how do you reform something that is so they would have a post-war, uh, role, some sort of post-war role in governing Gaza. Okay, let me, be, let, let me be telegraphic here. As long as there is a, Pal a Palestinian authority, and as long as it inserts itself in whatever form into something called the uh, Gazan entity, right? Quote, Palestine, unquote, Israel is unsafe. That entity and that authority are the vehicles for the return of terrorism and murder uh, and chaos. They have to be prevented from returning at all costs. That's to put it in a nutshell. It's, it's a non-no-show. Uh, it's not on the cards. It's a fold, failed policy to try and reimpose that. Something else has to be put in its place, which is deracinated, which has no possible connection to terror and, and uh, Islamist evil, and which is under the clear and continuing and effective thumb of Israel. It cannot be under the thumb of any United Nations-related so-called uh, security uh, authority like UNIFIL in Lebanon. Every United Nations entity has failed around the world, not only in the Middle East. The UN is a corrupt organization. Its head is as corrupt as Biden is in the US at the Democratic Party. The UN has to be reformed, if not simply done away with. What we should really have is something what I, what I call is the Association of Democratic States, which are clearly and uh, effectively committed to the basic human rights expressed in the UN Charter but ignored by three quarters of the UN membership. And we have to look at Europe as well. 
the Europeans again and again wind up supporting uh, the Arabs. They wind up on against Israel. Europe has to be resisted. Uh, the Euro European Union needs to be revised and reoriented. Uh, so there's a great deal of work to be done. We live in an imperfect world. What else is new? Well, what else is new? We live in an imperfect world. We will not transform it overnight. But we can, in fact, make sure that the thing we love, our entity, our reality, Israel, Jewish Israel, democratic Jewish Israel, is safe and sound and playing a key role in working for a better world. That's the Jewish point. Read, Chana, read Tanakh. Why are we on, on earth? Why has Hashem put us on earth? It is to, to make a better world. It is to live in hope. That's our you know, function, the function of the Jewish people from the time of its foundation, from the call of Abraham forward. And we are called today. We are called today, no less than Abraham was called then. Things aren't so hot for the Palestinians. They live under corruption. They know it. Youth are have have little chance of a future. Uh, what can be done? Uh, is there a, a, a liberation are, movement? Is are, there a resistance movement? We are. We are good. Persons? We are good people. Jews are good people. Most Christians are good people. Liberal, secular people are good people. They mean well. Uh, we, 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 we cringe at the civilian casualties going on in, in, in Gaza today. They say 33,000, but that's, that's propaganda. It means nothing. That's a figure coming from the Hamas authorities. It's all, all lies. By the best estimates, and there have been several good ones, read the Wall Street Journal, the, 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 Israel has killed about 12, 13,000 Hamas fighters, and a lower number of civilians have probably perished. That's a ratio of less than one to one civilians to military deaths. That is the lowest in the history of, of world warfare. I am a specialist in the history of World War II, by the way, so I can tell you that. Uh, Andrew Roberts, the great historian of World War II, has testified to this. David Victor Hansen as well. Uh, civilian casualties in Gaza are relatively low, certainly compared to, say, the American campaign against ISIS. The Americans murdered, killed civilians in the, the siege of Mosul. Um, that was friendly fire. When the Americans do it, it's friendly fire. When Jews do it, it's genocide. So the Arabs are very clever. The propaganda is very clever. They play on the good intentions of Western people, including Jews. And uh, we, we care for the, the Gazans, but we should remember, as recently as now, uh, in polls taken in the West Bank and taken in Gaza, now 70 to 75 percent of the population supports Gaza, supports the murders of October 7th. They is there any kind of they, 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 resistance? They, 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 is there any point. kind of underground movement against their own corrupt leaders? Let me make my point. Right? They voted for Hamas. Hamas came to power in 2005, 2006. In an election, they beat the Palestinian Authority, they beat Fatah, they beat Abbas, they came to power. And in 2007, they made a coup d'etat in Gaza. They took power by force, they killed members of the Palestinian Authority, threw them off buildings, and established a dictatorship. And one of the great mistakes Israel made, by the way, was that in 2005, trying to be forthcoming to the peace process, blah, 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 we withdrew Jewish residents of Gaza, right? We took them out. We forced them to leave, in fact. And they were there as a tripwire, and they were there as a security element. We took them out. We maximized the control of Hamas, a terrible error which must never be made again. Now, to your question, is there an underground? Not that I can see. The only underground they have are 350 miles of tunnels built under Gaza with the aid that was supposedly going to go to the civilians to build up a civil society. What a joke. And the ability, their ability to, to build 350 miles of tunnels over 14 years without Israel security intelligence being aware of the extent of that network is part of the failure of October 7th. There, I, there, there is no underground. There are 
innocent Palestinian people, I'm sure, obviously. There are people who want to live, who want to make a living, who want to bring up their family. But they are weak and they are uh, unrepresented and they are subordinated to the Palestinian Authority on the one hand or to the Hamas on the other, both of them corrupt. Uh, and they go on to support what is being done in their name. After all, in, in, in the Palestinian Authority, when you kill a Jew and you're captured by the Israeli Defense Force, by its security, you are given a, 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 a life stipend. Your family is rewarded for your action. And the Americans have tried to prevent this with the Taylor Swift, uh, Taylor Swift law. Uh, that no no aid will be given to the Palestinians if they continue to support terrorism by subvening murders. But under Biden, that has been allowed to lapse, by the way, along with much else. Uh, so no, there are potential, I wouldn't call them pro-Israel figures, I would call them figures for whom the destruction of Israel is not a primary consideration, who could in fact be be brought along and uh, made part of some kind of uh, subordinate authority. We have to realize that Jews are in the real world. Power is a, is, a, is a reality. We have to use power. We don't like that. We're not used to it. We were without power for 2,000 years. It hasn't been easy to come back, to build an army, to defend ourselves. And in Gaza and in Lebanon with Hezbollah, we have to act on our interest on Jewish self-interest and prevent any recursion, any revival of the horror that we have experienced since October 7. If we can find willing cooperation in that community with fairly decent people within a framework which we control, all power to it. But that's going to take decades. It's got to be slow and gradual, and we can't be rushed. We can't be panicked. And we certainly can't be panicked into recreating the very structure which has murdered us. One final question. Is there light at the end of this tunnel? If there is no two-state solution and it's a myth and a delusion, which you've exposed very, very successfully in this presentation, what is the solution? Well, I think I've tried to 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 argue that uh, the solution is the victory of Israel over both Gaza and over Iran. Iran is the many many headed serpent. Uh, I don't think there's going to be peace in this region, relative peace, uh, until the Iranians are dealt with. We are looking at a bizarre situation at the moment, in which the Biden administration appeases the Iranians. It's, it's Biden and company who have given them $100 billion since 2021, money they're using to suborn American interests in the region and globally. Uh, they're allowed to export their oil largely to China uh, by, by Biden. Trump blocked that off and almost entirely. They were dying under, under Trump. They didn't have any money. Biden brought it all back. So Iran is the, the, the hydra, the head of which has to be cut off. And it's a hydra which is on the edge, by the way. This is the, the most incredible thing. It's, it's, they are on the edge of nuclear power. They have already enough enriched ore for at least three or four bombs, according to the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Association. They, they may explode a bomb tomorrow. They have the missiles. They're exporting missiles to Russia. They're giving Russia, the Iranians are giving Russia the, the drones and now ballistic missiles. Uh, they are going to, they threaten the great Satan as well as the little, by the way. The Iranians hate, the Iranian mullahs hate the US more, if anything, than they hate the Jews. The Jews are next door, we'll do with them first. Then we'll deal with the big Satan, the US. The US is the Christian dash secular uh, God that they have to destroy in order for uh, their, their imam to return for their version of messianic peace to be imposed on the world under their hegemony. And they're on the edge of getting a bomb. And still the Democrats and Biden and his Jewish lackeys support them. Think about the insanity of that. Newt Gingrich is entirely correct. It is literally insane. 
So what is the solution? The solution is to put an end to that through democratic politics, with a small d. Throw the bums out, and they're worse than bums, believe me. Win the election, win the uh, event, win the war in, in Gaza. Create a, a stable region for the Jewish state and for the world. That's what's at stake. I, I, I'll end where I began. He, Israel is a kind of tar baby. Israel is sticking to the, the Democrats, sticking to Biden. They can't get rid of it. Thank Hashem that that's the case. We're a tar baby. We are the millennial tar baby. The world has tried to get rid of us again and again and again. It doesn't succeed. It will not succeed. There's a reason for that, which we understand. That's the solution. Thank you. Thank you all. בקרוב תזרח השמש, נדע ימים יפים מאלה, הלב נלחם בדאגות. כולם יחזרו הביתה, נחכה להם למטה, הלוואי נדע בשורות טובות. כי עם הנצח לעולם לא מפחד, אפילו כשקשה לראות. כולם ביחד אף אחד פה לא בודד, שישרפו המלחמות. עם ישראל חי, אם לא נשכח תמיד להיות מאוחדים. עם ישראל חי, בעליות, בירידות, גם בשעות הכי קשות. הקדוש ברוך הוא שומר עלינו, אז מי יכול לה... חלתנו, לא תיפול כעת רוחנו מסביב ברזל של חרבות. ויונה תפרוס כנפיים, התקווה בת שנות אלפיים, עוד נצא לשיר ברחובות. כי עם הנצח לעולם לא מפחד, אפילו כשקשה לראות. כולם ביחד, אף אחד פה לא בודד, שישרפו המלחמות. עם ישראל חי, אם לא נשכח תמיד להיות מאוחדים. עם ישראל חי